Grace and peace be yours in abundance. This is Season 7 of Guerrilla Christianity. My name is Pastor Brent Walker, and I'd like to thank you for listening to Guerrilla Christianity, an unconventional, no apologies exposition of God's grace from an evangelical Methodist point of view. Now, the Word of God is central to all we believe, so let's get into God's Word right now. And I would invite you to keep your Bibles out and turn them to page 246 of the New Testament. That's where we're going to find our reading from Jude today. Uh, We're going to be reading verses 24 and 25. This is the end of the general epistle of Jude. We have for the past nine weeks been looking verse by verse through the book of Jude. Uh, A short letter, but uh, certainly packed with wisdom. Wisdom that we can apply in our lives. And that's why the series title has been Practical wisdom from Jude. This is wisdom that we can not just read about, but also apply in our lives how we can live uh, more Christ-like lives. In the first week, we, we asked the question, why Jude? Why are we reading this letter? And we looked at its introduction. Uh, this letter does not appear in the revised common lectionary that we follow. And so I thought it might be a good idea to, to read it through as a, as a summer series. Uh, and so for the past nine weeks, we've been looking at it. In the second week, we read Jude's exhortation to contend for the faith. He said, I wanted to write about our common salvation, but instead I have to write this letter. Contend for the faith. Why? Because there were people who had crept into the church unawares, who were preaching a false gospel. They were saying that since that Jesus had died for our sins, that there is no more such thing as sin, and so that anything goes, anything that we want to do, we can do. God has freed us to sin. Uh, that uh, That is not what the gospel says. The gospel says that Christ died to free us from our sin. To free us from the bondage of sin. And that is the true gospel. And so we are to contend for the faith. In the third week, we, we said we are to obey God. Why? Because these uh, people were like those in the desert who complained to Moses. You know, They were delivered from their slavery and then immediately started to complain. We need water. We need food. You brought us out here to die. You know, God didn't deliver us from our sins so that we could suffer. He delivered us so we could flourish. And so God provides for us. We are not to complain like those. We are to obey God. In the fourth week, we read about rebuking evil. And we saw that Michael, even Michael the archangel, did not rebuke the devil when he contended for the body of Moses, but instead he said to him simply, the Lord rebuke you. The Lord rebuke you. In other words, it is God who rebukes evil. Uh, And then in the fifth week, we read that we were to bear fruit. Why? Because these were like trees in autumn that had no fruit, that were bearing no fruit. Uh, These... these, uh, False teachers were like those who bear no fruit. And so, we as Christians are to bear fruit. And we looked at the fruits of the Spirit from Galatians. Uh, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. How we are to bear such fruit by the Spirit of God. And then in the sixth week, we, we looked at what it meant to please God. Why? Because these were those who were pleasing God. Men, They were saying things that, were, that would get them in the favor of people. They were, like, they were like those hypocrites that Jesus talked about who would stand on the street corners to, be, to pray openly to be seen of others and to receive praise from people. You know, They wanted to please others, but we are to please God. Now in, this, in the seventh week, 
We looked at what it meant to persevere. We looked at the example of Johnny Erickson Tata, who was uh, paralyzed as a teenager and has spent the last 52 years in a wheelchair. How is it that she's able to persevere? Because she, like us, has an eternal hope in Jesus Christ. We're not like the world. We, the world only promises suffering and struggle and toil. But God offers us eternity, eternal life through His Son, Jesus Christ. And so we are to persevere. We can persevere because we know that God is with us. Last week, we looked at saving others. We said, well, okay, so all these, these people are teaching this false doctrine. What do we do with them? We just discard them? We toss them aside? No. Jude says, even those, save them. Have compassion on those who are wavering. Have mercy on those who are wavering. Save others with fear. Pulling them out of the fire. Snatching them out of the fire. And um, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. So, even though these were teaching a false doctrine, we should still reach out to them with the true gospel and show them the error of their ways so that they can be saved. It's been quite a journey. This week we're ending with, uh, with a, a, an exhortation to praise God. We're going to look at the last two verses of the book of Jude, verses 24 and 25, which are a sort of uh, benediction or doxology. We're going to look at that in just a second. For now, let us hear the word of the Lord. This is Jude 24 and 25. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to the only wise God our Savior be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. God of all wisdom and knowledge, we pray for your Holy Spirit to abide in us, that we may hear your word to us this day and grow more like Christ day by day. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. There are many words that we use in the church that have very little meaning outside the church, you know? Um... People don't understand the words like communion, Um, the narthex. I I had no idea what a narthex was when I came to church. I'm like, they're like, go out to the narthex. I'm like, okay, where's that? Is that somewhere near the attic or uh, narthex? What the heck is the narthex, right? But we use a lot of churchy words, salvation. What does salvation mean? Well, there's a couple of words that we use, and we use them every single week, whether you know it or not. Um, Those words are a benediction and doxology. Have you ever really given much thought to what those words really actually mean? A benediction is, uh, uh, you know, I always thought of the benediction as just what the pastor says at the end of the service to sort of send us forth. In fact, in the Methodist church, we use the word sending forth or, uh, or going forth with a blessing, you know. Um, the word benediction, it comes from a, two Latin words, bene, which means well, and disere, which means to speak. So, um, benediction is a good word. Okay, it's a good word that we give at the end of the service. It's a short invocation with a blessing. We call it sending forth or dismissal with blessing. I remember when I was growing up at Pittman United Methodist Church, our pastor, uh, Reverend Reasoner, used to uh, always give the benediction from Numbers chapter 6, where it says, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. You know, it's a, it's a great benediction. It's a benediction that God prescribed to the people of Israel back in the book of Numbers. Um, as I came here, when I first came here, I didn't know 
really what kind of benediction to use, and so I used that one a lot. But then another one sort of evolved out of my desire to go out and seek and to save the lost. I have a heart for evangelism. And so I, I, I sort of came up with a, a different uh, benediction, which is sort of an amalgam of different benedictions. And it went like this. May the God of grace and the God of glory be with you now as you go from this place into the world to declare to the world that Jesus Christ is Lord of all. Everything that we do should be pointing to Him. And everything that we, everything in our life should be uh, extolling the, the virtue and the glory of God. And so that was the benediction that I was um, very fond of in the first couple of years of my ministry here. Recently, I've you know mixed it up a little bit here and there. Um, sometimes I write a different benediction for the week. Um, sometimes I use that one, and sometimes I use the one that's at the, at the, at the end of uh, the communion liturgy. You know, uh, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. You know, it's a it's a sort of a triune benediction. Um, a doxology, on the other hand is a little bit different. A doxology is a little bit different. It comes from a Greek word, two Greek words, doxa, which means glory. And so, <clears throat> doxa, if you, if, you, uh, if you look at the word orthodox, for example, orthodox means true glory. True glory. Okay? That's what orthodox means. So, doxa is, a, is the glory, and Logia, which comes from the Greek word logos, which is a word. So logia is saying. So doxology is literally a glory saying. A glory saying. And what, is, what do we mean by that? It's a short hymn of praises to God. Think about the doxology that we sing at the, when we give our offering. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. It's a song of praise. Uh, we are giving God the glory. Think about the Gloria Patri. We sing that in, in Latin. Gloria Patri is glory to the Father. It's a, it's a lesser doxology written in the 3rd or the 4th century A.D. Very old, ancient doxology. Of course, we don't sing it in Latin. We sing it in English. And the music was actually written uh, in, the, in, the, <coughs> in the 16th century. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. That's our... Uh, our Gloria Patri and the doxology. The doxology written in 1674 and set to the tune of the old 100th Psalm. Uh, you find that same music um, in, uh, in one of our hymns, uh, All Creatures That on Earth Do Dwell, which is a uh, reconstruction of the 100th Psalm, Psalm 100. And so um, that is called the old 100th uh, music. But uh, the, the words of the doxology written by Thomas Ken, 1674. These are glory sayings, glory sayings that we give glory and ascribe glory to God. Well, this is what Jude is giving us today. Now, in some Bibles, in some modern Bibles, uh, for example, the NRSV, they use headings. Uh, for certain sections. And um, the headings themselves are not inspired. They're just sort of guidelines to tell you what, what this next passage is all about. Uh, you also understand that the chapters and verses are not inspired either. Uh, the chapters were given, uh, the, the chapters were um, uh, first instituted in the, in the 1200s. And the verses were first instituted in the 1400s. And those are really just given so that we can very easily find a particular verse in uh, the Bible. 
Um, same with the with 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 headings. You know, they they sort of tell us, they point us to what is this next section about. Well, interestingly enough, in the in the NRSV, the heading over chapter or over verses twenty four and twenty five is benediction. That's the heading in the NRSV. But in the in the English Standard Version, the heading says doxology. Now, which is it? Is it a doxology or is it a benediction? Well, in in all honesty, it's both. It's both because it's a good word or a good saying that Jude gives to the people reading this letter as an exhortation to go forth in the strength of God. But it is also a doxology or a glory saying in that He is giving glory to God. He does both in the same, which really makes this a unique and beautiful doxology and benediction. Um, you know, in the, um, in, the, in the 1932 version of the Methodist hymnal, uh, these verses are given as a suggested benediction at the end of a service, which I found fascinating. Um, and <clears throat> they're just beautiful. Think about this. Listen to these words. Now unto Him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of His glory with exceeding joy, to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. So, here's what we're looking at. Verse 24. First it says, Unto Him. Unto Him. All of this is unto God. He's saying, to God, to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power. So, so the, he's saying this is unto God. This is for God. So at the end of his letter, <clears throat> he has been exhorting the people to contend for the faith. And at the end, he says, all this is for God. All of this is for God's glory. So unto Him that is able to keep you from falling. Think about what that means for a second. You know, Jesus is able to keep us from falling. Think about two people walking side by side. One of them trips. One of them trips and the other reaches out and grabs Him, keeps Him from falling. Because we can stumble, but God keeps us from falling. Once we have repented of our sin. Once we have said to God, God, I'm living in a way that is not befitting a child of God. We turn away from our sin. We turn back to God. That's repentance. And then we put our full trust and faith in Jesus Christ for our salvation. Once we do that, we're justified. We're justified. It's just as if I'd never sinned. We, we, We receive the the. Uh, we receive the, the impartation of the righteousness of Christ upon us. And so, He is able to keep us from falling. Like I said, we, we stumble sometimes because we're, we're born in sin. It's our nature to sin. We can stumble, we can, we can, we can give in to temptation, but God keeps us from falling altogether. We stumble but He keeps us from falling. So I love this picture that He is able to keep us from falling. And to present us... This is, what, this, is what, um, this is how Jesus put it. We may stumble, but in Christ we will never fall. Jesus, in John chapter 17, He's praying for us. Okay, on behalf of us to the Father. He says, Holy Father, keep them in Your name, which You have given Me, that they may be one, even as we are one. While I was with them, I kept them in Your name, which You have given Me. I have guarded them, and not one of them has been lost, except the son of destruction, that the Scripture might be fulfilled. In other words, Judas was allowed to fall. Why? Because... It was necessary 
for the salvation of all. Jesus can keep us from falling. He, he says, I have guarded them and not one of them has been lost. He said, you know, in another passage he says, they cannot be snatched from my hand. You know, God has given us to Jesus Christ and we cannot be taken from Him. He is able to keep us from falling. To present you faultless before the presence of His glory. Faultless. To be faultless is to be without blemish. Now we are sinful. We have sin. We are not faultless. But we can be presented faultless to God. How? We are imparted with the righteousness of Christ when we put them on. See, because our sin was imparted to Christ when He went to the cross and He died for our sins. And then, on the third day, He rose again. And when He rose again, His righteousness is imparted on us. If our sin is imparted to Jesus, then His righteousness is imparted on us. To us. This is how Colossians says it. <clears throat> Colossians chapter 1, verses 21 to 23. You who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death, in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. In other words, He put to death our sin so that we could be righteous in the eyes of God. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you have heard, which have been proclaimed in all creation under heaven. Think about the words of Isaiah that we read today. Okay? In Isaiah, this is, this is what Isaiah was saying. He said, you know, all these sacrifices... God hates these sacrifices. Why? Because people would make the sacrifice and then they go right out and sin again. You know? And they, they just didn't even give any care. That's not what the system of sacrifices was for. The system of sacrifices was for when we stumble to keep us from falling, we had to make a sacrifice and it had to be perfect, a perfect sacrifice. But even... So, even when God says all this, He says, Come now, let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. See, it's not that we don't sin. It's not that we have never sinned. But God treats us as if we had never sinned. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. So, God imparts upon us the righteousness of Christ. This is what it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21. For our sake He made Him who, to be sin who knew no sin, so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. He made Him, Christ, who knew no sin. Christ was sinless. He made Him who knew no sin to be sin for our sakes, so that in Him we might have the righteousness of God. When God looks at us, He doesn't see our sin. He doesn't see our rebellion. He only sees the righteousness of Christ. Why? Because we have put Him on. We have put Him on. We trust in Christ the way we trust in a parachute. We trust in Christ the way that we trust an elevator will take us to the top floor of a building without crashing to the ground. We trust in Christ the same way we trust that when we step onto a a New Jersey Transit bus, we're going to make it to our destination safely. That the driver's not going to crash the bus. You know, we trust. We trust in all these things. We trust in Christ to rescue us from our sin. And by trusting in Christ, His righteousness is imparted upon us. So... He presents us faultless before the presence of His glory. Before the presence of His glory. As regenerated and perfect beings, we may stand in the presence of God's glory unafraid and without the threat of death. Why? Because 
God told Moses that no one can see him and live, right? Moses said, please show me your glory. This is in Exodus chapter 33. Please show me your glory. And God said to Moses, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. And I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But, he said, you cannot see my face. For man shall not see me and live. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock. And while my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock. And I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand and you will see my back. But my face shall not be seen. In our unregenerate state, we are unable to stand in the presence of God. Because His glory is just too awesome. We cannot stand in the glory of God. But God presents us faultless before the presence of His glory with exceeding joy. I love the way that the King James puts this because other translations, modern translations, just say with rejoicing. Rejoicing sounds very good, but exceeding joy, it sounds like my heart is going to burst from all the joy that is within it. And that's really how we feel when we are in the presence of God. We rejoice in God's presence at what He has done for us. 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 13 says, But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when His glory is revealed. Again, we can stand in the glory of God with no fear, but only with exceeding joy. Now unto Him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of His glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior. God is the only Savior. We are only saved by His grace alone. And remember that grace is unearned, unmerited favor. That's what grace is. We don't earn it. We can't earn it, in fact, because if we could earn it, we... If we could earn our way into God's glory, if we could earn our way into heaven, we could strut around heaven going, look at what I did. Instead of pointing to Him and saying, look at what God has done. That's the point, because He deserves all the credit for anything that we receive, or anything that we have. Everything that we have is by God's grace. And certainly salvation is only through God and His grace. God is the only Savior. We are saved by His grace alone. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8 says, For by grace you have been saved, through faith. And this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God. It's not the result of works, so that no one may boast. It's not the things that we do. You know, we do good works after we're saved. God saves us for good works. But we're not saved by our good works. We're only saved by His grace. We repent of our sin. We we turn from our sin. We trust in Jesus Christ as our only Savior. And so, God's grace is what saves us. And now we see four things that He ascribes to God. Glory, majesty, dominion, and power. Let's look at each one of those. To God be glory, be the glory. Uh, Romans chapter 11 and verse 36 says, For from Him and through Him and to Him are all things. To Him be glory forever. To Him be glory forever. All glory is for God. One of the founding principles of the Protestant Reformation is soli deo gloria. Everything to the glory of God alone. You know, uh, the great composer Handel, who wrote wonderful music, praising God. Uh, He wrote the Messiah, 54 pieces, 54 pieces, uh, oratories, that were taken straight from the text of the Bible. And every bit of it pointed to the glory of God. And everything that Handel did, every, at, the, at the bottom of every score of music that he wrote, he wrote the letters S-D-G, Soli Deo Gloria. 
everything to the glory of God alone. In other words, Handel said, no glory to me, everything to Him. You know, I must decrease, He must increase. That's, that's the way our lives are to be ordered. Revelation chapter 4 says, You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. We only exist because of the creative intellect of God. That's the only reason we're here at all. If God had not decided one day to speak everything into existence, we wouldn't even be here. But He did. He created all things by a command, and so to Him belongs all glory. Then the next thing, be glory and majesty. To God be majesty. God is King of kings and Lord of lords. And even kingdoms that don't acknowledge God still fall under His authority. Still fall under His kingship. Even uh, an atheist communist nation like China is still under His kingship. He is the King of kings. He is the Lord of lords. Deuteronomy chapter 10 and verse 17 says, For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, and the awesome God. You know, we don't have to acknowledge His greatness for Him to be great. We don't have to, we don't have to believe in His existence for Him to exist. He is God. He is the King of kings. He is the Lord of lords. And so to Him be all majesty. To God be... Uh, dominion. Dominion is another word for authority. To God be authority. Uh, God has all authority on, on heaven in, in heaven and on earth. Why? Because He created it all. He made it all. To God be the authority. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 16 says, For by Him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through Him and for Him. To God be all dominion. Dominion or authority. And then finally this, to God be all power. To God be power. Think of the power it takes to command everything to be out of nothingness. To part the Red Sea, to flood the world, to still the storm, to raise the dead. God is omnipotent. It's a word that means all-powerful. There is nothing that He cannot do that He sets His mind to. Jeremiah chapter 10 and verse 12 says, It is He who made the earth by His power, who established the world by His wisdom, and by His understanding He stretched out the heavens. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power. And then he ends with this, both now and ever. Uh, Other translations say, before all time and now and forever. In other words, God has existed in eternity's past. He exists now and He will exist Forever in the future. In Revelation chapter uh, verse uh, verse one and or chapter one and verse eight, God says, "I am the Alpha and the Omega," says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. <coughs> he is now. He was in the past. He is to come. He is the uncreated one. He has always existed. He always will exist. He is eternal. God has always existed and will always exist. He is immutable. He is not subject to change. In all times, He is God and is worthy of all glory and praise. Throughout the book of Jude, the writer has been giving us examples of what not to do by showing us what the godless are doing within the church. Their desire is for the pleasures of the world, satiating the flesh which is never satisfied. They are lovers of themselves. They hold themselves in highest regard. And in this most beautiful of doxologies, Jude exhorts 
the faithful in Christ, both in His time and to us today, to praise God, because God is worthy to be praised. Think of all that God has done for you. He formed you in the womb. He gave you life. He made you in His image. He created the ground beneath your feet. He created the air in your lungs. And how do we repay Him? By rebelling against Him in sin. Turning away from Him to please our dead flesh. And this infinite and eternal God of love demonstrated His love for us in that while we were still sinners, He sent His one and only Son to die for us on the cross, paying the price for our sin so that we can be presented faultless before Him and praise Him for all eternity. This is what God has done. But as Creator of the universe, He deserves praise from all creation just for being. May our lives be lives of praise to God our Maker. May our mouths be ever filled with His praise. Let us go forth and live lives of praise to God now and forevermore. Let us pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we praise You, for You are worthy to be praised. We give You all glory, honor, might, and majesty. Yours is the glory. Yours is the power. Yours is the kingdom here on earth. You are the King of kings. You are the Lord of lords. And Lord, we we thank You that You love us so much that You rescued us from our own destruction that we can live and stand faultless before You and clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Though our sins be as scarlet, they are white as snow, washed clean in the blood of the Lamb. And so, Lord, we thank You. We thank You. We praise You. Let all of our days and everything that we do be lives filled with praise. Let let Your praise be ever in our mouths in everything that we do. Not Not just during this time on a Sunday morning, but at every meal we give thanks for the food that You have provided. In the morning and in the evening we give thanks for the air that is in our lungs. We give thanks for the lives that You have given to us. We put our lives in Your hands throughout the day. And we know that You provide for us in everything that we do. We praise You. We praise You for we are fearfully and wonderfully made in Your image. We praise You, Lord, for sending Your Son, Jesus Christ, to rescue us from our sin. All this we pray in the mighty name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Thank you for listening to this edition of Guerrilla Christianity. My prayer for you is that you have been blessed in its teaching as I have been blessed putting this message together. God has also blessed me in appointing me to serve two churches in Salem County, New Jersey, Ebenezer United Methodist Church in Auburn and Hudson United Methodist Church in Pettertown. And if you live in the area and don't have a church to call your own, I'd like to invite you to join us on Sunday mornings. Ebenezer meets for worship at 9 a.m. and Hudson meets for worship at 10.30 We also have Bible study during the week. Now, if you enjoy this podcast and would like to help support it, please share it with your friends and family. Hit like, leave a comment, and also subscribe to our YouTube channel. Just search for Guerrilla Christianity. Keep learning, keep growing, and I pray you will join us for Guerrilla Christianity again. Until next time, live for Christ. He died for you.